Welcome to Kung Fu Data Wrangling in Python with Pandas. My name is Brian Kafferke, and a confession, I'm actually a big fan of Kung Fu Panda. I've got the movies. I have a, a daughter who's actually in college. I usually drag her. I have two daughters, but I take the younger one and usually drag her to movies to see Kung Fu Pandas because I do like it. I think it's funny, and I think it's lighthearted, and there's a lot of good Buddhist philosophy in there, too. And in honor of this presentation, I actually have a panda coffee mug, really more of a tea. I think I'm going to take the cover off. I think it's easier to drink out of. But kind of cool in honor of this. I have a Python mug I just got too, so I'll probably use that next time. All right, so let's jump right in. There's a link at the bottom of the slide which shows you where you can get the uh, slides for this and the content. I'm going to have a Jupyter Notebook, which has a good example code. Uh, so look out on my GitHub account, github.com slash slash shared, and you'll find Intro to Pandas in there. So what are the uh, goals of this presentation? Well, I want to talk about what pandas is and a little bit about context from Python. How do we get pandas? Not the animal, but the library that helps us code in Python. Understanding pandas, using pandas, and finally, more resources, like where do we go from here? So a little about Python. If you're not familiar with Python, then this would not be the best video to watch as an intro to Python. And if you think I should do an intro to Python, put comments into that effect and I will consider doing that. But there are actually a lot of good intro to Python videos out there, many books, etc. Um, I actually like, like one, I think it's called Introducing Python as a good intro, but there's a lot of good books out there. But I'll give you a little smattering if you do choose to continue either way if you, or if you just want to brush up on like what is Python. So Python is an open source object oriented scripting language. Now, scripting usually means a scripting language has a prompt and you can type in commands directly and it's interpreted. It's technically doesn't have to be object oriented. Python's unique in many ways in that it can support procedural programming and just function programming, or it can support object oriented programming. But generally, it is used heavily in object oriented programming, so you need to know that, especially with pandas. The focus on Python uh, is on readability, so the philosophy seems to be that. We maintain code as programmers a lot more than we write new code. And so being able to read code and understand it's really critical. And there's a lot of things, there's standards called the PEP standards about how best practices for coding in Python. And uh, there's a term called being Pythonic, meaning that you follow sort of best practices on how to code and make things understandable. Uh, it's extensible. So Python is very extensible through thousands and thousands of free open source libraries. So one of the things that makes Python particularly desirable is that a lot of developers have written some amazing libraries that you can use to extend the functionality of Python. So it can be used in pretty much any application you can think of from web apps to video games, you name it. And of course, data science, machine learning. Now, having said that, you should be aware though that if you weren't to bring in any of these external libraries, by itself, Python as a language is not the best for doing data analysis or any kind of statistics. There's no really great support for that. It's, it's a pretty generic language. Uh, it's a good language, lots of eloquence to it, but it's the extensibility of these modules that really gives it that extra power. And the other thing I do want to point out is Python is what's called a dynamically typed language. When you create new variables, you do not tell it what the variable is. You don't say this is going to be an integer or this is a string, etc. So if you're in a language like C or something, you would actually say this is an int and things, and it's, it, it will enforce that. Because Python is dynamically typed, pretty much lets you create variables on the fly and throw whatever you want into them. And uh, that can add some overhead and also open you up to potential risk of bugs in your programs because people could put things in that you weren't expecting. So why pandas? Well, some of what I talked about is, is the thinking behind it, but pandas addresses the need to support processing of tabular data. What do I mean by tabular data? Well, there's a library called NumPy, which, which came out, which is extremely efficient at handling arrays, multi-dimensional, single-dimensional arrays, but it, it does not support what's called data frames, which is sort of more like tabular data, like columns and rows, thinking like name, address, et cetera, zip code. So that's what Pandas really number one purpose is, is to process a sort of abstraction layer above just a simple arrays. So it addresses that and then it does it fast. So we'll talk about NumPy, but NumPy is written in C and Pandas is written on top of the NumPy package. As a result, it's very fast as NumPy is. And if you didn't have this, then processing arrays in Python would be extremely slow. And that's hence the need for it. 
And the, a lot of that, it gets back again, that dynamic typing, because Python objects incur a lot of overhead. It has to store a lot of information about what is in your objects. Okay. So what is Pandas? So it's an open source Python package, which actually the name comes from panel data. If you read a book, Wes McKinley, McKinney actually talks about the fact that's where he can't get the name. And I think he said it's an economics data kind of term. And so that's where it comes from. And it's kind of cute Then he was able to make a play off that of Pandas. It has rich features for supporting data manipulation. Conceptually, it's very similar to data frames in R, but the similarities really end pretty quickly from once you get beyond the conceptual framework. Syntax is quite different. It also allows us to not just manipulate data, but we can save data and read data from many formats. And it's very fast, as I mentioned, and built on top of NumPy. Also, if you're going to be doing any kind of data wrangling and things in Python, Pandas is the standard. It's, it's the de facto library people tend to use, so you're going to want to know it. So how do we get Pandas? There's three methods of getting and installing Pandas, and I am covering the order that I recommend them. The first thing I would recommend is, if possible, just install Anaconda. Go to the Anaconda distribution. The link is there. You can go to my go to GitHub, get the slides if you want to just click on the link. But really, if you just search on the internet and say Anaconda Python, you'll find it, I'm sure. And you want to install the Anaconda distribution because it includes pandas and all the dependencies of it, but it also gives you all kinds of machine learning libraries, visualization libraries. Pan, uh, Anaconda is really the distribution if you're interested in doing data science. It's the best distribution, but there is a, a fair amount. You're going to have to have some a few gigabytes of space available on your hard drive just to, to install it. So if you don't want to do that, a, a mini version is Miniconda. The other thing is, is a utility called PIP, which allows us to install things, and Conda also has... Anaconda and Miniconda have another utility called Conda, which lets us manage packages. So it's another good reason for having it. But if you, for whatever reason, already have Python installed and you refuse to do the other two, you can uh, go to pandas uh, pandas.pydata.org, this link here, and it walks you through what you need to install. But again, you're going to have to make sure you have everything. Um, so I would favor the Anaconda distribution if can. Now, the last point there is you may want to install a virtual environment. I'm not going to cover virtual environments here, but typically uh, when you see tutorials on Django, they almost always, which is a web development uh, framework, they always talk about using virtual environments. And similar when using pandas and doing data science, virtual environments are a way that we can, all the packages we're installing, the versions, etc., can be installed in a specific folder. And so it kind of containerizes or contains, we should say, all the things we have for our project. And we want to do that because there's actually an example I'll show you here in which there's a backward incompatible change that was made within Pandas itself. So if you aren't careful and you don't do virtualization, you don't do create a virtual environment and keep track of everything, then you could end up a new version of some library, Pandas or something else could get installed and break your code. So that's the biggest reason for doing it. So when you just, if you were to deploy, say to something on the cloud or somewhere else or in your own environments, you now have all the dependencies self-contained and you can avoid breaking your code. And that's really the biggest reason for virtual environments. If you're just playing around, probably not as critical, but if you're intending to use this in any kind of production mode, you're gonna to wanna to look at that. Lots of videos out there, just look for Python space, virtual ENV or virtual environments, and I'm sure you'll find a lot of good information. So once we have Pandas installed, we need to import the libraries that are on a system. And typically we bring three different ones installed always when we're using Pandas. First is Pandas itself. Excuse me. The other one is NumPy, which is, as I mentioned, it's a very efficient library uh, of array processing, which is written in C. And another one, which may not be so obvious, is something called Matplotlib. And that actually gives us a lot of visualizations. And Pandas integrates with a lot of the Matplotlib visualizations. It makes it really easy to, to do some things to analyze the data visually. And that's really important because sometimes people forget, like when you're working in data analysis and doing data wrangling, you're going to want to look at the data. You know, what are the distributions? How does it, how does it, uh, you know, maybe I want a histogram or I want to get a box plot, et cetera. So it's, it's really good for that. Now, when you install import packages, if they're really popular packages, they're sort of standard conventions. So when you import pandas, you typically use the PD prefix. So you say import pandas. If I didn't say as PD, I would have to prefix my functions with pandas dot, et cetera. PD means now I can prefix instead with PD. That's the standard. Anyone who uses Pandas typically will do this. Um, so it's a good way to show you know what you're doing when you're coding in Python. 
NumPy is also typically brought in, and that is the MP prefix, and then matplotlib is the PLT, and that gives us the visualizations. I want to jump into the fun stuff because I've seen a lot of, uh, honestly, pandas training videos and introductions, and I find that they get really bogged down in a lot of the NumPy stuff and using what they call series, et cetera. And so I want to, those are great things. They're not, they're important, but I want to really get to what I think is the fun stuff, which is data frames. So in some ways, the reason I want to do that is because I want to show you just how cool and powerful Pandas is. So you'll be committed to learning it. And I do encourage you to back up and, and get those background pieces. And if people watching this think it's important to cover that they want me to, I, I can do another video down the road that would get into more series and, and arrays. So I'm not going to be talking about series one dimension, which are one dimensional labeled arrays. We'll talk about, we're going to skip over that. We're not going to be talking about NumPy arrays. We'll be implicitly using NumPy, but it'll be through pandas. Um, so what we are going to talk about instead is data frames. What are data frames? Well, the easiest way to think about it, if you think of a SQL server or database table, imagine you query that table and bring it into memory. That's how I think of what a data frame is. It's an in-memory table. And if you used to R, then you can think of it very similar to R data frames, because conceptually, it's really identical. And again, the idea is it data frames are really tabular data. So rows and columns, name, address, zip code, maybe an amount that somebody purchased. The idea is, and you might want to sort and group and do things with that data. So you can think of it a lot like a spreadsheet as well. If you used to Excel or something, uh, it's similar to that. Now, the definition that you get from the documentation online is a two-dimensional label data structure with columns of potentially different types. You can think of like a spreadsheet or a table. So if we look here, so this example on this slide is showing you uh, through a Jupyter Notebook. I have a data frame I already created called DF Sales, and you can see it displayed. So you see it's just, it's just tabular data, right? Columns and rows of data, something we probably have seen. Notice there's a, a thing to the left that does not have a name, a column name, and those are called indexes. And that's also, I think when they say labels, that you could think of what it was before mentioned as labels. We have column labels, column names, and then we have these indexes. Now the index is, if you don't tell it anything else, when you create a data frame, you'll automatically get a sequential number, very similar to uh, what's commonly done in SQL Server. You get an identity column and it just increments every row and it creates, and you use that as a primary key. So again, if you think of SQL tables, it is similar to a primary key. However, it does not necessarily have to be unique. So you do have to be careful. Don't think of it as like a unique identifier necessarily, but it is a way to locate rows. And you can see in this example, I'm gonna get into a lot of the more in a big demo. In this example, you can see that by doing a set index, we can change what is used to find things in the data set. So what we had was the automatically generated one, but in the sales data, I have a sales order number and I decided I wanna use that as the index. So I can use set index to change it. And then you can see when I display the data, it will display the, uh, the sales order number now where it had just been displaying the index of like an incremental number. We'll look at that more. The other thing to uh, take away from this, notice when I do that, I'm saying data frame name equals, and then I do the set index. And that's because in many cases, when you do operations on data frames, they do not change the actual data frame unless they support and you use an oper a parameter called uh, re uh, replace. I, I think it's in place. We'll see it later. Uh, so, but generally, and this is true also of R, when you do things, it's gonna return back a result set and it's up to you to store that if you wanna keep it. Not always true though, you do have to be a little bit careful. So, but I do wanna, in general, that is true and you'll see me typically assign it to new. So, to a new data frame. So before I jump into the demo, I wanna give you a little encouragement, depending on where you are coming from, if you have no experience with pandas, points of reference that you already probably have or may have that may give you some leg up and hopefully give you a little encouragement. One is, again, I mentioned if you come from the R language and you've used data frames there, conceptually you have a big leg up, you'll, extend, you'll understand exactly what's going on. Again, the syntax I'll talk about in a minute is different. Also, there's the SQL language structured query language. Any relational databases use this as the standard language, though there's slight variations. If you understand how SQL works, you're in a good place to understand how to use pandas. But I will give you a sort of caveat there. Data frames 
are not just tables, they can also be thought of as two-dimensional arrays. And that's not typically true as much in a SQL table. A SQL table, you think of rows and columns, it's a table, and there's all kinds of concepts around it. But So you can actually say, I want the 50th row. No values, I just want to get that, that subscript essentially in an array, and you can do that. So we'll see that in the code. And if you come from Excel and you've done a lot of data wrangling in Excel, I think a lot of people who come to Pandas really are coming from, including I believe the author is kind of coming from that more of a mindset than a SQL mindset even. So if you're coming from R, you can see that there's a lot of similarities. You can actually see this is on their online reference, um, a mapping. So you can do the same kind of things in Pandas you could do with an R data frame, but it's a little different syntactically, quite a bit different. First of all, R is very function-based. You can see on the left, all of the R equivalents of doing things with data frames are functions because R is typically a function-oriented language, whereas what Pandas is doing is Python, and so it's using instances of objects. So the df dot is a data frame instance, and you're calling methods and properties off of that. So they are syntactically pretty different, and uh, sometimes that can really throw you. So just be aware of that. But it, conceptually, it's good. you got a good jump. What if you're coming at it from SQL? Well, then you're coming from it from some more of a set theory. So you can think of populations, customers and employees. And maybe customers and employees never intersect. They're completely different. If they intersected, you'll see overlapping. And so Venn diagrams are typically the conceptual framework for relational databases and set theory as put forward by EF Codd way back in the day. And he came up with this whole thing based around these kind of Venn diagrams, intersections and unions. So we might have the intersection between two data sets, customers and employees. Or maybe we want the, we're gonna have all rows, everything from both, that's in the red. Or maybe we want everything except the ones where there's an intersection or only the ones that are on the right side in this case, or exclude rows that are, uh, exclude rows actually in this case, yeah, on the left side. And so the point of that is, this is this is how SQL operates and conceptually how you can approach it. And if you're learning SQL, I highly recommend using Biden diagrams as a way to get your head around it. Uh, and you can approach pandas this way, but pandas does a lot more than what you can do in SQL. And I just really like this slide because this link, which I found on uh, Stack Overflow, has a really nice outline of how Venn diagrams tie to SQL statements. And now if you're coming at it from Excel, again, you've done a lot of the similar things in Excel that you'll be doing with pandas, but the difference is this is programmatic. So you're using programming statements to do it as opposed to manually joining and matching. All right, so let me jump in and get into the demo here. So I'm gonna pop over here for a minute. And I'm, I'm jumped right into a Jupyter Notebook. If you, in a, if you install Anaconda, you will get Jupyter Notebooks automatically. You can see here, um, somewhere in here, Anaconda, and you can see I have Jupyter Notebooks there. And a Jupyter Notebook is a browser-based way that I can run code. It's Jupyter actually supports more than just Python, though it is written in Python. Jupyter supports like 80 languages or more now. So you can do R, you can do Julia, you can do anything you want, as long as you get the language kernel, which supports that language. Um, but we're gonna, I have a video, by the way, on Jupyter Notebook. So you know, if you're interested, go check that out. That'll give you a better orientation on how to use things and stuff. But suffice to say, uh, there's documentation like this that are called markdown cells, just allow me to annotate what I'm doing. And then you have these code cells and code cells are always have this labeled in, and then you'll see things where you'll see out as we go along. And that's the output of the cell. So it's, it's really nice for demonstrating and teaching, especially because the output's in stream. You can say, here I'm running code, here's the output, makes it really easy to demo things. So um, now with this little percent is called a magic. And I need this because when I do matplotlib, I need that so that it will render output correctly for visualization. So I'm gonna press shift enter. I could press um, this little button here to run a cell, but I'm gonna do shift enter. There's some keyboard equivalents, I'll run that. And that ran that code, there's nothing to see, so it doesn't show me anything. But if I didn't do that, it wouldn't recognize my uh, the libraries as being imported. And I'm going to import the OS library so I can get the current working directory using operating system command. And that tells me this is where I'm sitting, not surprisingly, where my Jupyter notebooks are. There's a link here I put in here, which is really great. I, I found it myself and thought, this is great. Covers all the different magic commands in Jupyter Notebook, so feel free to look at that. Now, another way I don't have to really use the OS command here, I'm gonna use PWD, and that will also tell me the present working directory. And uh, I can also, what I wanna do is, 
one of the things I'll be doing in my demo is I needed some sample data, so I decided to extract uh, data from Microsoft's AdventureWorks Play data set. It's what they use for training. It's completely fictitious, but it has all these relationships, so it's really good for demoing and doing things. And this ls command, which I can run directly, gives me a directory listing, and it shows these are the files that I'll be pulling in from. I think only a couple of these files, but I have four of them there. Now, when I type things in, I wanted to clear this out, but I can do something like pd dot. If I hit the tab key, I'll see that in this library, the pd library for pandas, all the different methods. So I can pick something and say, oh, I want that one, and it will pull it in. And in particular, what I'll see is um, I may want to do something like two, and two lets me write to different formats. Um, or I could say read and do tab. And these are the different formats I can read using pandas directly. So pretty cool. So I'm going to use the read CSV and load a data frame right here. And you can't see anything yet, but now I can display the data frame so you can see it. And this is a really small data frame. It's junky data, but just to show you how you would do it. And you see columns and rows. And again, as I mentioned, you see this index 0 through 4. Now I can use a method off of this instance, this data frame, which will show me the data types. And so I can see there's an ID, salesperson ID, it's an int. If it's strings, it shows up as an object. And overall, the data from itself is an object. Suppose I want to see just the first three rows. I can use the head method. Methods are identified by period, dot, and then some function name, basically, which is a method. And so that lets me just first see the first three rows. If I don't give it a parameter, I think it defaults to five. So we're going to use another method, describe. But I'm also doing something I can say the data frame name and then a column name and you can see total sales is up here right and I'm going to say describe and let's see what that does we can see it gives us a bunch of statistical breakdowns so it's giving us means averages etc specific to the total sales column so this is one way that I can identify a specific column within a data frame that I want to reference it's not probably the best way though because if you had spaces in the column name it doesn't work and there can be other limitations uh, for instance if I want to select multiple columns so another way I can do it is by using this bracketed notation. And it pretty much will give me the same thing. This is just bringing back the reference to total sales columns. And so I could also do a describe on that, etc. cetera. Um, so here I'm going to say dfsales.describe. Now I'm not telling it the column, so it's going to do it on all the columns that are numeric that it can that can do these numbers. So I get counts and means, etc. And my quartiles for total sales and salesperson ID, because those are the numeric columns. Maybe I just want to get the mean, and I can do that here by just asking for the mean, and then I just get just the mean, the average. So I'm going to bring in another data set now, Internet Sales, so I'll have a little more fun stuff to play with. And if I look at this, I'll see that a lot of columns here, so there's more to play with. And uh, I, although I can see how many columns, I didn't want to display all the rows. I can find out how many rows and columns I have by using the shape method. So by doing this, I can just run that. And it tells me I have 60,398 rows and 26 columns. And as before, I can say I want to reference a specific column, in this case, sales order number. And I'll do a head statement, which will only give me a first few rows. And a couple of things that you'll notice is that I can basically, in, in many cases, excuse me, in many cases, I can do what's called chaining methods, which means I can say, here's a method like get a count and then dot some other method and then dot another method. So it's a little like piping. Uh, it kind of reminds me of PowerShell piping. Uh, that's what you can do with methods. So here I'm going to say, get me the sales order number, but just give me the first few rows. And that's what it's doing. Now we can also filter. And if I wanted to, I can say, so I'm, I've got this data frame, AW sales now. And I can say sales amount greater than 2000. And I'm only going to display first few, but you get the idea. Notice it just says true false values, which means if it is greater than, and then given row, if the sales amount is greater than 2000, then it comes up true, otherwise it's false. Well, that's great, but probably not terribly useful. How would I actually make it filter the row so that I'd only get the full rows back? And I do that by passing that in as the parameter to the data frame as shown here with the bracketed notation. And now I get an actual list and and I can see that the sales amount is indeed over 3,000. So that's that's how I can now use pandas and this uh, 
way of referencing it to the back of the bracketed thing to treat it and filter the data frame. Now, it's important to understand that when we deal with data frames, there's two ways you can look at it. You can think of it like a table and querying the way you would in SQL, but you can also think of it as a two-dimensional array and saying, I want column five, row six, uh, excuse me, row six, column five, you know, and that kind of thing. I want rows five through six, and I only want these columns, that kind of stuff. So that ability to slice, as they call it, is supported by data frames. So it's a, it's, and that's where the functionality gets, I guess, richer than you would think in SQL. And so one way to do this is I want the actual subscripts. So think array subscripts, which means the physical position, row zero, one, two, and you might think three, but watch what happens when we run this. And I'm going to limit it by doing this. I limit it to just the column product key. Notice that we get zero, one, two, but it stops. So one of the, I find less intuitive things is that that's not inclusive. If this were R, it would be inclusive. So three would be included in this. But this is again, using a subscripted approach. Now here I'm going to be doing the same thing, but I'm actually asking for the rows one and two, uh, excuse me, columns one and two. So this particular notation is actually asking for, for columns one and two. And remember things start at zero. And so I get just columns one and two. And the head statement just limits it to five rows. Here I'm doing this a similar thing, but I'm actually asking for rows two through eight. And again, it's not including this. Now it is because the index is actually a sequential number, it looks like I'm referencing the index value, but I'm not. I'm actually referencing the position. All right. So here I'm going to do something now, AW uh, rows one to five and only and, and two specific columns. And you can see that I can query that. Now you can do this approach and it's pretty cool and it works well, but it, it's not as performant as if you use some specific methods provided by pandas to locate rows. So let me go here. Uh, so for instance, one of the methods is called iloc. So notice I say the data frame name, and then I say iloc, and then I can give it a couple of sets of what I want to see. So I want to see positions from zero to four, but I also want to see positions from eight to 12. So the idea of iloc stands for integer, the i, location. And personally, I find it a less intuitive method name, but that's what they call it. And the idea is, is I want to find things by position. And so I can do this kind of thing. And I'm looking for uh, basically these two things. Okay. And let me correct um, something I kind of got wrong there. This actually is, this part is the rows, so you can see zero to four. This is the columns. And to kind of make that point, I could say something like, um, just change this to 10 and I'll lose some of this. So you can see it reduced the columns. And, uh, and that's a good point too, because I actually had to look at that. I still have to look at things and say, what is it doing? I want to say this is going to select two sets of rows, but it doesn't. It's actually selecting rows and columns in this case. And that's using iloc, but it's using it's using subscripts, so it's not using names. Um, in this case, um, I'm going to be doing a row subscript in column numbers as well. But here I'm actually telling it what columns I want: one, four, and six. So if I run that, I get that output. Now here, I'm going to be doing something called set index. If I go here for a minute before I run set index. You can see that the index, which is how I access rows where I can, I can go after things. Um, this is basically like a key. It's a numeric, it's just a, a number, a sequential number, but I want to change it. So it's going to use sales order. So I can do that and let me run this and then I'll run this again and notice that the index will change. And now you can see that the sales order number is, is there instead. Now drop equal fault is interesting because what that does is it, it means that when it makes it the index, it does not get rid of it. It also keeps it as a column name that I can reference. So which is kind of important if I don't want to lose the ability to query that directly. Because um, once it becomes an index, I don't reference it really by name anymore. So you can see I've set the index and now I can use that to query things. Once I've done that, I'm using the loc. Now loc must be distinguished from iloc. And yes, it's confusing. But what loc does is it allows me to access 
the data via the values of the index. And I specifically changed the index to sales order number. Otherwise, it would be very confusing because I'd still be giving it numbers that look a lot like subscripts, but it's different. I'm actually asking the values that are a part of the, the index. So let's just run this and see what we get. And since I gave it a loc and I passed in, and by the way, these, these brackets, a little uh, colon, that essentially means anything from the range, this number to this number. So typically it would be something from one to five and it means that range. In this case, it's two strings. And so I get these two rows back because that's what it's looking at. So that's what the loc does. It accesses by the index. Now to kind of emphasize that, suppose I tried to do loc here, only I give it numbers, which would work with the iloc, and I get an error because it's a string column, not a numeric column, and I can't access it that way. So go back here. Um, you can see just kind of showing the data again. And if I again, if I wanted to see a single column, I can do that. So let me go back here now. So now I'm going to be using loc, and I want to. This is going to say give me all rows, okay? But I'm limiting the columns. And I'm putting a filter right after it. So notice I end my brackets and start a new bracket. And then I can put a method after that. So I can chain all these things together. And what I'm getting is just the columns I requested based on, uh, so just the columns I've asked for. I've asked for all rows. Um, but then I'm filtering the rows to only those where sales amounts greater than 3,000. And the head statement restricts it so that I'd actually get a lot more rows, but I just want to kind of demo this. Now there's an interesting method, which is kind of a hybrid or a chameleon kind of method called IX, which is for index access. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not totally a fan of it, and I think it's kind of a, a best practice not to really use it, but you want to know about it if you see it. What it does is it tries to figure out whether you want to use iloc or loc based on the context of what you pass it. So in this case, um, the index is the sales order number. So if I give it a sales order number, which is a string, it will work. Um, but at the same time, I could also give it a number, and that works. So you can see that either way works. So it kind of can be like it does basically what iloc and loc does with one function. But again, um, the documentation even re recommends probably not the best method to use. Being explicit is better so that people can read what you're writing, and that's very Pythonic. All right, so another thing I can do with loc, I'm going to say, I'm going to say loc, and then I'm going to pass in this filter. And that will allow me to find only another way, basically, of finding where the sales order number is a specific number. And so I get just that row. So there's different ways to approach this. This is another way we can filter. Um, now, the reason I wanted to do that is because I want to show you how you can update data. So we can see that by doing what I did, I'm actually, that's my index, and there's only one with that number. So if I do the exact same statement, but this time I say equals to 999, and let's see what we have over here. So we can see that it's it's not 999, it's 399, 3399.99. But now I'm going to change it. And then if I query that, you can see that it actually changed it to 999. So I've just updated the data frame in place. It's important to understand, I haven't saved it or anything, so it's not affect anything. If I were to reload the file, I would go right back to what I had. Um, if I, I do this, I can see if it has my 999 in here. Yeah, I'm not sure. So th that's fine. What I want to show you here, so you can see sales order number is the index. To get back to what it originally has uh, as the index, the default, I can say reset index as a method. In place equal true, meaning in this case, I don't have to assign it to another data frame object. I, it'll change it right where it is. Um, and drop equal true is just because now I have sort of a duplicate key and I can't put that number back in. But drop Drop what drop originally did is it allowed me to retain the sales order number as a column. So I can't add it back in since I never lost it. But I can change that. And watch what happens now when I query this data frame. It went back to the zero one one thing. So that's really the point. You can reset your indexes. There's a lot to this. And I'm only touching on the surface. So there's a lot here. And, and every time I looked at this and thought about doing this presentation, I kept seeing more things. Well, I really should talk about this. I really should cover this. So I'm really just doing a smattering in spite of all the stuff you're seeing. Uh, I'll talk about books and things you can get that will get into a lot more depth. So what I want to also do, sometimes when you have values, you want to do a sort. So this is going to sort by sales amount. And you can see that I can get up to the top here. 
you can see that it is sorting by sales amount and it kind of gets bigger and bigger. So sorting is important part when you're doing data wrangling. Um, again, just to see this, it did not save the sort. So if I go over here and you look at sales amount, you'll notice they're not sorted. So again, I didn't replace anything and you have to bear that in mind. Typically it's doing something and just returning it. And that's common in a lot of things. Now I may want to save my file. So I can do that using the two CSV method. And by doing that, my data frame is gonna actually be saved to a file. And I can prove it by using the ls command. And you can see my extract is now there. So I have a, a save data set of CSV. And again, if you wanted to, you can do a tap command here and, and you can see all the different things we can save to. Pickle is a good way if you have any object, you can serialize it with the pickle command. And one of the nice thing with pandas is it's really good for storing in a lot of common formats in them. Kind of psyched that it also supports Excel directly because sometimes that can be a bit of a pain to work with uh, unless you extract it to a CSV. We can also do what's called a group by. And what that means is I'm going to do some aggregation summing. And so when I run this, I, I'm basically sum up. You can see product, promotional key, which is the first part, and then product key. And then I'm getting an aggregation of any numbers that can be sort of summarized here. And so that allows me to do some some pretty cool aggregation. Um, didn't see any ways in that particular form of the command to say specifically what columns I wanted to, but you can specify access, etc. cetera. Um, but it's pretty cool. You can do stuff there. Another thing I can do is uh, if I want to reorientate the data, and this happens sometimes, for instance, you might have something like general ledger data, which typically has balances each month, January, February, March, all through the year, and we're year end now when I'm doing this, really relevant. You might say, it might be like, suppose you had the data and it was actually stored January, February, each month separately, but you really wanted to see it across. So maybe you want to add them all up for the years or whatever. Um, you can do that by pivoting the data. And so I'm going to use the PD. Now notice this is using the library function, pivot table. I pass in the data frame and I'm telling it, this is the amount I wanted to select out. This is the uh, the index to use. And let's, let's run it because it's easier to explain once you see the output. So you can see that the sales territory key is at the top. Okay, so it's, it's using that as a way. It had been going down this way. Now it's going across. So there's a limited number of values. It looks like there's 10 territories. So it makes it kind of easier to see that. And what I'm actually seeing for each one is the sales amount. And um, yeah, and the order line number you can see is is over here. It's been, it's using that now as an index. So I've really created a whole different data frame. I haven't really changed anything because I haven't saved this, but it's, it's showing the data as a pivot table. I could sign it to another data frame and then persist it or whatever I want. All right, so we're not done yet. Joining. So if you're used to SQL, then you, you know that joining is a big part of that and Pandas has support for that as well. I'm gonna bring in a new table so we can join and that's the AW product. And if I wanna see what that table has, I can look here. A lot of columns, but mostly it's like a product inventory kind of thing, like what's the name, how many are in stock, etc. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take a subset and put it into DF product. I wanna just get these columns because I got way too many to be able to talk about. And now that I've done that, and remember, see, I am assigning it to a new type here. Then I'm just getting these columns, which I can work with more easily. So the merge statement, and I find this less intuitive. I would prefer calling it join like SQL, but they call it merge. So when I want to do a join, I say merge. I give it the data frame I'm coming from. So one data frame, the other data frame. What's the key I want to join on? Product key. Default is an inner join. So if I do that, I get... A join between these two things and you can tell that I did because I get all this model name and stuff that's specific to the product on the left so it did work um, if I that's an inner join but what if I wanted to do what's called the left join then I would add this extra piece how do I want you to join I want you to do a left join which means that I'll always get everything on the left side even if there's no match on the right so I, I could get more rows if there were any missing this one there should be no missing because it's designed not to but you can change that to left, right, outer, etc. So there's a lot of flexibility in the joins. Again, if I want to see how many rows and columns, I can do this. And I want to show you um, another example. So that's how I do joins. Look into it. There's all kinds of joins. You can do it. That could be a topic in itself. So I'll leave you to go look at that more. Um, but I also want to talk about what if you want to concatenate two different sets of data. I've got, you know, I've got employee names and I want to concatenate the customer names. Well, I wanted to kind of prove that out. I'm gonna actually use the same table twice, but I should end up with twice as many values. So I'm using 
the data frame AW product and you can see I have 686 columns. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up this frames and I'm putting, I'm, basically I'm just passing this in as a list essentially. I'm gonna put these two things together and then I'm gonna say concatenate those two. So it's gonna concatenate these two data frames which are really the same data frame twice. So I should get a, a duplicated concatenated data frame. So imagine if I had Mary Jo Harry, then I would have in this Mary Jo Harry, Mary Jo Harry, right, twice. And then I'll show the shape. If it works, I should have twice as many rows in the end result. And not surprisingly, because I did try this, it does work. So that's really the idea. So the, the takeaway from that is simply that if you have different sets of data and you want to be able to sort of tack them on one after the other, that's where concatenation comes in. All right, so I'm getting close to the end of my demo. I do, I would feel remorse if I didn't, or remiss, I guess I should say, if I didn't talk about missing values. A big part of, da big part of data wrangling is having missing values, which they call NAN or nulls. And so I'm creating this data frame. I took this example right out of the uh, documentation of the site, just to give a good example, because it has nulls. Um, let me run that. And so I created a new data frame called DF. If I run this, really simple data set, but we can see uh, we have a none in the toy. We have uh, we have one complete row right here. And then when we get to the Joker toy, we have an NAN for age, which means not a number. So these are missing values that we need to look at. And I can say DF is null, and it will show me true false is as a grid where nulls are present. The documentation, I have some explanation here. This is where you get into wanting to separate versions of pandas. They made a backward incompatible change, and I had to go to this uh, Stack Overflow to find out what happened. But essentially, the documentation I was reading said use isNA, but isNA was, it does not work with the version of pandas I have. I have to use is null. So the code itself, so had I had a version that was using one or the other and then they broke it, then I would have all my code breaking. So really good to protect yourself by using virtual environments. So do it. All right. So another thing I can do is I can say drop NA. And what that's going to do is it's going to drop any rows where anything, any of the columns are null. And since only one good row is there with none, I get one row back. Um, I could say only drop it if all the rows, that's where the how parameter works. And so I get all the rows back because there are no rows with all. And there's, there's all these different things you can do there. Again, the data frame looks like that. Now, what I can also do, notice that the data frame itself never changed. If I wanted to capture the drop NA any, for instance, then I would have to assign it as I do here, a new data frame. And then if I display it, I get the one row. So imagine if I had maybe you know a million rows and half of them were good, I could do that and save it as a separate data frame. The other thing I can do is I might want to, notice the values here, I might want to sometimes fill in values that have nulls or not, or not a number, et cetera. I may want to replace them with some other values. So maybe I have nulls for sales amounts and all it really means is nothing was sold. So I, I, I know that it means just set them to zero. Well, I can do that by setting a default value and that's fill in A. And you can see when I did this, I used done O, like I don't know something, to make it clear that this is where it's setting the values where the nulls were. Uh, so just be aware of that. So this, it's kind of handy. Let's be careful with that though, because if if you had something like sales amount and, and it's null and it really means you don't know what it is, but there is a value potentially, you don't want to just go out and do that. Okay, finally, we, we're using matplotlib and one of the nice things about it is pandas integrates with matplotlib so you can use it kind of integrated with your data frames. So for instance here, I can use a column and get a box plot. And you can see here I can do my box plotting. And let's see if I can, if I click this, I can drag things around. Kind of nice, you can actually do some visualizations in here. Um, all that kind of stuff. You can save it. So that's kind of cool. And um, you know maybe I want to do something here when I'm going to say something similar, but I'm going to do it by currency. And now I'm getting all different box plots. So when you're doing data analysis, Obviously, you're going to want to get a feel for your data. You want to understand what the values are. You can see that the box plots I really like because it shows you outliers. It also shows you the range of values. So it's a very useful kind of chart. Histograms are also good. So here's another one doing a histogram. Lots of good stuff. I'm, I'm really barely touching on the surface, but I did want to just kind of show it. It's very powerful, really good. So I, I think it's, it's nice to make use of it. And it certainly is part of what you would want to be doing in data analysis.
All right, so let me get back to my riveting slides here. So now let's talk about your panda's journey. And what I want to tell you is like, it's a lot, all right? I, I, I actually started thinking, I'm going to do a pandas video. And I want to make sure I knew a lot about it. And I found that the more I read, the more I found. I've got a book uh, I'll mention that's like hundreds of pages by the author of pandas. You can go on and on. There's a lot of features. It can do many things. It at times is not truly intuitive. I think I have a slide for that. It's not always intuitive. Um, so give yourself some patience. Learning is always evolutionary, but some things are easier to pick up than others. For you know, If you have to pick up a little bit of something, you get one little thing. Oh, cool. I have a new tidbit and I know it. But this is not that kind of thing. Pandas is, is, is deep and wide in terms of content. Very powerful, very good. Um, but give yourself time to learn it. And if you watch this and you picked up a few things, then you know more now than you did when you started. So you're ahead of the game. So finally, wrapping up, I want to give you some pointers and maybe where you can go to get more information. But there's tons of stuff out there. You know, This is definitely a topic where there's no reason to be confused or scared and say, I don't have anywhere to get more information. There's tons. YouTube videos, such as the one I'm doing now, there's a lot out here. There's books, etc. And so I'll give you a couple of references I really like. First one is this book by Wes McKinney. Um, I'm actually still going through all of it, so I don't have complete expertise myself. I'm evolving as well, but I really like it. I was surprised because as the author of the Pandas package, I thought maybe he'd kind of go quickly over it or not explain it very well, thinking people will just know. But he does a really good job of lots of examples and he explains it really well. So really like the book a lot. Um, and some of it is a bit obtuse. The other part of it here is also the pandas.pydata.org. There's a lot of great stuff. In there, you can see at the top of the, the page documentation. Click that. Lots of documentation in there. Not all the documentation has the kinds of examples I would like, but there's a lot of stuff in there. There's a 10-minute tutorial. There's a deeper stuff. So between these two things, you've got plenty of stuff. But if you like Safari Online, and, this, and I do that as well, and I get tutorials there, or any of your favorite online websites or training places, I'm sure they'll have stuff on Pandas. Pandas is really popular. So in summary, I hope I've covered a lot of useful things here. I'm aware that I have not covered everything. I'm also aware that I've purposely excluded quite a bit. And the summary is I could go into a lot more depth. But my goal was to be quick so that you would be able to get on with your life. And hopefully you get something useful out of it. And my biggest hope from all this is that you realize that Pandas is very powerful, that it's really great, and it's it does cool stuff, and you're going to want to use it in your work and, and develop a better expertise around it. So until next time, please like, share, let other people know about my training videos, and uh, thank you.